All right, I got another reply from David Chester. I had sent him the reply from Professor Jean Brimon. So I'm kind of, I've been kind of moderating their, a discussion between them. Well, I guess I got, I think I got two replies from uh, Jean Brimon in response to David Chester, who's a PhD in physics in uh, quantum field theory. And so I sent um, David Chester the the Basel Highly paper I was reading last night on uh, Bell's inequality. And the, the issue between um, Chester and Brimon was about wormholes being just theoretical. And the this has to do with the the ER equals EPR um, claim of the universe, the Einstein-Rosen wormhole um, versus or equals the, or is created from the um, spooky at, at addiction, at, at addiction, wait, at a distance, <laughs> what am I saying? Um, Anyway, spooky at a distance. Um, the, in other words, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, Rosen. So, actually, my own. Um, I mentioned before how my physics professor Herbert Jane Bernstein. Um, cited a, in a footnote he mentioned in one of his papers how Einstein himself had pondered this possibility in the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paper that it could be some kind of wormhole a microscopic black hole as a wormhole that explains um the quantum non-locality or quantum entanglement. The, the issue here is whether quantum entanglement is a artificial construct that has to be created under very unique conditions or if it's fundamental to reality as non-locality. And so the mainstream physics view is that quantum entanglement, it de decoheres rapidly and based on the uh, Planck's constant and the collapse of the wave function when you have a particle, when you create a particle. So, um, oh, sorry, somebody walked past. Basel, Basel J. Hiley, he points out that with um, when helium is created, it inherently um, requires entanglement of the electrons from hydrogen um, through fusion, I guess. And I, you know, I haven't studied the details, so I'm not, since I'm not a physicist, but the, the problem with the Schrodinger equation though, as Basel points out in this paper on Bell's inequality is that um, the complex conjugate in the Schrodinger wave function just assumes that you can cancel out the imaginary negative frequency and time reversed um, part of the wave function. And when you're squaring it, to get the amplitude 
when you're scoring the amplitude to get the probability of the, lo the location of the particle for the particle to exist. So when you actually do the measurement, then you have this collapse as the quantum measurement problem. But in non-commutativity, or what, what was called the de Broglie-Bohm model, is um, you have this, the imaginary part of the wave function is the actual um, quantum potential from the future and the the problem is is that most physicists ignore it because you get the same result as the uh, collapse of the wave function in the Copenhagen interpretation so there's really there's only really a philosoph philosophical reason to explain um, reality that there's actually this um, non-locality non inherent to reality. It's not just quantum entanglement. Um, and the non-locality, it violates primitive causality of linear time. So you have the future influencing the past and so most physicists ignore this because it can't it can't be used to, to send a signal in a external measurement. So there's really no purpose to it except to explain the ontology, the truth of reality in terms of philosophy. But um what Basil J. Hiley is stating is that the, in his collaboration with David Bohm, that the, the actual truth of that imaginary part of the Schrodinger equation is actually non-commutative. And because it's non-commutative, then it, it also can be applied to relativity and the spin of the quantum spin and and therefore in in terms of the relativity and the quantum spin the non commutativity is required to explain the experimental um, results and these would include the um, you know I don't, I'm not even going to get into that the experimental results because, I, like I said, I'm not, not a physicist, so I don't understand enough about the different types of experiments. But um, now what makes non-commutativity fascinating is that, as uh, Professor Sean Majid uh, pointed out in one of his talks, is that the, in terms of a black hole, the singularity of the black hole it, in, in terms of the gravitational singularity is, is uh, counteracted by the quantum uh, propulsion as anti-gravity. And so it stabilizes the wormhole um, because of the non-commutativity of the quantum and the gravity combined together. And so then, um, if you look at John Kramer's writing, his physics, he, he came up with this transactional interpretation, which was inspired by Olivier Costa de Beauregard, the um, protege of Louis de Broglie. And the... the the transactional interpretation is very similar to non-commutativity, but it's it doesn't it it's it assumes that non-commutativity only exists after the observation is made, where you have asymmetric time due to entropy. But the 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 um, non-commutativity 
of as non-locality exists in the uh, sub-observable um, wave in this in the before the collapse of the part of the wave for the particle before the particle exists. So it's and the other thing about it is that it is active active information as an algebraic process. And so it's not an ether, but it's what Roger Penrose calls proto consciousness. So it's not a materialistic medium medium, but it is this mathematical algebraic process that's going on whether we observe it or not it's an ontological truth of reality that we can model with the mathematics but it's still it's going on inherently and it was discovered the non commutativity was discovered from heisenberg um studying the transition frequencies of the ritz ryberg combination principle in spectroscopy. There I said the word right, spectroscopy. And so, what, as um, Alain Kahn emphasizes, um, music theory is actually the simplest way to explain non-commutativity based on the frequency and the time, frequency and time being non-commutative. So essentially, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of um, position and momentum actually originates from Fourier uncertainty of time and frequency, but that Fourier uncertainty of time and frequency actually originates from what Louis de Broglie called the law of phase harmony based on time and frequency, but what is actually a non-commutative non-locality of the transition frequencies. And in music theory, this is what Alain Kahn just calls 2-3 infinity. So then the problem is it, it comes right back. I lost my light. <laughs> it's because of the um, wildfires in Canada. It's just too hazy out. Okay, there we go. All right, so this brings us back to uh, Jean Brimon um, saying, well, there's no experimental proof for the wormholes. But if we look at the weak measurement experiment, they, they're calling it a negaparticle. So it's um, negative mass as a evanescent or ghost particle because it it's sub -obser observable, which means it it exists. It if the future is affecting the past, and you can and by using a entangled photon, and that and they're they're going to test this now with the entangled. Um, argon also for mass but the this will prove that um this the weak measurements essentially are proving this wormhole because it's negative negative mass now um yakir aranov is quick to emphasize that this does not violate um relativity as primitive causality because you're you're tweaking the momentum and then in the future you're measuring the particle or vice versa and so either way you're not sending a signal from the future to the past but um at the same time yakir aranov says that this, this does explain the double slit experiment because it does prove that there's this non-local modular momentum that is telling the, telling the electron whether the 
second slit is open or not open. And um, so the, the only way to explain that non-locality is that it's a signal from the future to the past. And so in, um, in the, the, uh, the approach by David Chester with um, Jack Sarfati is to is to come at it from a relativistic uh, quantum field theory using a non-unitary um, mathematics or physics. So, and then they they use a frolic uh, coherence uh, pumping approach, like a frequency time pumping, or what they would call a phonon as a quasi um, particle. And this is essentially what um, Olivier Costa de Beauregard also was was arguing, you know, is happening is that you're, you're having this um, relativistic pumping because of time invariance that it causes a precognitive signal from the future. Now, in a sense, these these models are both correct because in terms of uh, quantum biology, the non-unitary pumping is what you do when you turn the light around because the spiritual ego is the light, the biophotons. So it'd be a coherent uh, laser photon that you turn around. And this is actually demonstrated again with the... Um, Archimedes screw experiments by uh, John Pendry's research group, Sir Sir John Pendry, where they prove that you can absorb uh, virtual photons to create more photons um, using negative frequency. And John Pendry, you know, he says if you if you use negative frequency by circulating the light back around onto itself, then you get very strange effects that violate the conservation of momentum. And de De Broglie's model also, the De Broglie law of phase harmony also violates the conservation of momentum. Now, technically you can't call it energy because it's before the amplitude is squared as a probability to create a particle. So you're dealing with photons that don't have rest mass, but in terms of um, what a particle is, the as uh, um, Gerard de Hooft emphasizes in his uh, What is Light article, or light is heavy, with uh, Martin Vandermark, they're 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 relying on the De Broglie law of phase harmony to then say, well, actually the photon, it has gravitational mass, and and it has, and that matter inherently is made of the photon, and so then John G. Williamson worked with Martin Vandermark to develop this idea, this model of the particle as a trapped photon, but it's also non-commutative. And and John G. Williamson was the first to really emphasize that Louis de Broglie's um, law of phase harmony is actually non-commutative, which makes sense because it's based on time and frequency. So the in terms of the Planck's um, constant, you have the frequency going up as the particle goes towards the speed of light. But in terms of relativity, the time also goes up as the particle goes towards the speed of light. So based on 
the Pythagorean music principle, the frequency is inverse to the time and therefore logically Louis de Broglie realized if both of these are correct, which they are, there has to be a time reversed negative frequency. Now, the problem that Basil J. Hiley points out that the problem with de Broglie, as de Broglie later realized in the 1960s, is that um, it's energy, but it's not a materialistic medium. And so therefore, um, he was calling it a guidance pilot wave before, but as soon as you use the word wave, you're implying a medium, even if that medium is space-time. And so this is why Basil J. Hiley calls it pre-space, because it's, or and, and it's also why um, Penrose calls it fundamental time. And then, and Penrose explains it with the idea of the time being cubed, and the, so it's the phase of the time that is the non-locality based on this cube time from the imaginary number. And then Luke Hoffman calls it a primordial time. And so he models the imaginary number as the algebraic process, as an an iterant process of time. So you have this discrete algebraic shifting of the time that's asymmetric. And this is the emphasis also of Roger Penrose that the time is asymmetric. Now, um, Alain Kahn, he, he calls it primitive time. So, Luke Hoffman calls it primordial time, and then Penrose calls it fundamental time, which is a phrase you got from Lee Smolin, who also has a De Broglie Bohm model of physics. And then, and Lee Smolin was also a student of uh, Herbert J. Bernstein, and who was the same teacher I, I had. But um, so Bernstein's big point, though, is that you have to you need to take quantum physics as your first physics class because otherwise you get brainwashed by classical physics as the wrong foundation of reality and i never took um classical physics in high school i didn't take physics so the very first physics course i took was the quantum physics and then he, he taught us the dirac dance to explain non-locality. But um, Basil J. Hiley is stating that the, the transfer from the 2 pi as the uh, circle uh, to the 4 pi of the sphere being non-commutative so that you have this Dirac dance of the Mobius um, strip you know, we have an inherent twist, a Mobius, um, what do you call it, a Mobius strip, is that it? Or Mobius band. Uh, anyway, um, and then if you take two of those, you make the Klein, the Klein bottle. But as, um, you know, as people point out, if you're honest about the Klein bottle, you cannot envision it in... Um, in uh, space time because it's a four dimensional space as a model. So you have to, the only way it works is to consider it as a time, as a, um, the future and the past overlapping in, in order to get that extra dimension of space in it. And you can't visualize that inherently, but in terms of quantum biology, you can rely on logical inference of time and frequency directly by listening. 
And when you listen with your eyes closed in meditation, then you're able to resonate directly with the um, superluminal uh, signal that um, Gunter Nymphs first documented in experiment. And so the experiment, the superluminal signal that Gunter Nymphs did relied on the signal being before any amplitude. So it's just the phase as time being inverse to the frequency. And when you have a Fourier analysis as a group wave, just as the, it's essentially the same as the Louis de Broglie um, law of phase harmony, so that the group wave has a superluminal negative frequency um, that that's a time reversed phase, but it has to be non-commutative, which means there's no rest frame. There's a, there's no symmetric rest frame that enables you to then um, square the amplitude for the probability. So you can get it, this signal as long as it's a pure time frequency signal by not measuring the energy as amplitude. And since it's non-commutative, it's not limited to the quantum scale. And this is also Basil J. Hiley's big point, is that um, you can't have a time frequency uh, squeezing um, because they'll, they'll, all, they'll often study like squeezed photons um, but below the below the scale of Planck's constant, um, then in the reduced form of the for the sphere, so it's Planck's constant divided by uh, two pi. Then, um, which is called h bar. Then you have this inherent one half spin that it can't be it can't be squeezed so it's essentially that's the it's the mathematical non non locality that then is found in the uh, Clifford algebra that um, Moyle Moyle used with von Neumann and so the this is what Basil J. Halley's working on for his next paper, is he's discussing the symplectic geometry that's inherently um, non-local, but it arises from this non-commutative algebra. So the, in other words, the non-locality as non-commutativity, it's not even quantum. It's the mathematics is actually before quantum physics. It's from the in the eighteen hundreds, and um, it just wasn't properly understood to be uh, applicable. It's it it explains. I mean, it it explains quantum physics. It's the basis for quantum physics. So it's not it's not classical either. It's just a different kind of the it's, it's the non commutative algebra. And so that's what Basil J. Halley is working on. But in terms of quantum biology, the key emphasis is that you're dealing with the photons directly. Because if we realize that all matter is made of photons, then our consciousness already is photons that we then turn around to create this non-commutative, non-local, uh, superluminal resonance from the negative frequency and time reverse signal. And then we can store that energy in the body and 
it also enables like precognitive visions and um, eventually levitation and telekinesis, um, long distance healing, um, psych psychometry, where you pick up an object and you can get the past and the future from that object. And you can feel the, uh, the object vibrating based on the photons directly. And so then um, reality becomes interactive as a holograph. And because it's non-commutative, you have this eternal flowing. So like in the uh, New Age um, scene, they'll, they'll constantly talk about balance. And that, that word balance actually is based on the wrong mathematics. It's based on the wrong um, Western symmetry. And so that's why you have this difference between relativity and quantum physics. Because the in terms of quantum biology, the, the relativity is the spiritual ego. And it's this idea that you can contain the infinity inside the body and then through the light. But the light is, is always the astral realm. And this was Ramana Maharshi's big point in terms of meditation was that only the formless awareness is real because that's the only thing that's eternal. This eternal time that in India they call, you know, Kala, that is also Kali. Kali being the cosmic mother who will never be observed because it's the eternal flowing as time that also creates and destroys um, matter and, and, and also space-time. Space-time as defined as a linear um, 4D process that's limited to the external measurement of the speed of light in relativity, where the speed of light is the invariance. So this is um, a quantum biology process. The meditation is, that's why it's called the highest uh, technology of all technology, because it's also the secret of life as a uh, negative entropy. And so Roger Penrose figured this out because he says that the true power of the sun is from the gravitational potential as which is the dark energy as negative entropy from, and he says that all mass, all mass originates from quantum frequency. And so that's based on the De Broglie-Einstein relation that is actually the law of phase harmony. That's another way of stating the law of phase harmony that Louis De Broglie called his greatest uh, discovery. And even though he got the Nobel Prize and he called it his greatest discovery, the law of phase harmony, it's not taught in uh, physics classes. Um, but it has been, it was re-emphasized re by Gerard de Hoof and uh, Martin van der Mark and then uh, John G. Williamson, who worked with um, Martin van der Mark. And so this also explains the current ecological crisis in terms of, of entropy, because the global warming is all based on the photon radiation as entropy, because the um, the Earth transforms the solar radiation into a lower frequency, and based on the Planck's um, constant, the energy is from the frequency. And so you increase the entropy when you lower the frequency. And so um, this, what, what this does is it delays the rate of the radiation based on uh, Kirchhoff's, Kirchhoff's law of the frequency as the basis for the absorption and radiation 
of the energy of matter. And so the photon um, entropy is actually then the infrared energy is what powers the mitochondria, which, which also powers the, the algae in, on Earth. So the, normally, in the normal cycle, the algae absorb the photons and then emit oxygen. And this is the foundation for life on Earth, for complex life, because the algae then became the mitochondria that are the sym symbiotic in the cell for the um, for complex life on Earth. And so when we meditate, we are then increasing the infrared um, entropy that's trapped in the body, but it's being absorbed by the mitochondria in the body, essentially the algae in our body, just like in ecology. And then we're powering the um, mitochondria directly um, without relying on food. And so the more somebody meditates, they enter into what's called bigu, which is in Chinese, in uh, Taoism, that's the called energy feasting as a um, natural free energy condition based on the meditation. And they even had an academic conference about bigu. Uh, it was led by Rust, Rustam Roy, a chemistry professor. And the conclusion was that, that there was some kind of gamma, gamma radiation was a byproduct of the meditation because when they tested Qigong master Yan Shin, they realized he's increasing the gamma radiation. And so once again, you're getting this um, essentially what uh, was discovered by Fabio Cardone using his ultrasound uh, sonotrode as acoustic cavitation is that he calls it a space-time deformation. So you're getting this quantum micro um, black hole wormhole signal as a um, quantum negentropic force as, a, as an energy that then can transmute matter and give off radiation. But the, the radiation is like a byproduct. So it's not the same as uh, radiation from uh, from normal um, nuclear, you know, decay, the decay process. Um, it's, it's not random. It's based on this non-commutative resonance. So the, um, the gamma frequency as a radiation then, um, is how the new matter new matter can be created, but it's due to the quantum negentropy as a quantum coherence uh, with a superluminal, um, what was called in, in Taoist uh, alchemy in Qigong, it's called the superluminal yin matter um, as the golden key. And so this is what you store back inside the, the lower dantian in the small intestines through the mitochondria and, or through the um, microtubules in the neurons, which are a negative refractive index. So based on that negative refractive index, you're getting the one half spin as a room temperature 
superconducting quantum coherence that is able to then transmute the negative frequency virtual photons into increased photon energy in it, but it's doing it through this anti-gravity negative mass um, and time reversed time reversed uh, negative frequency. So it's at, it, it also creates space time. You can actually change change space time and create space time from this level of reality. And that's why you can have precognitive visions and experience um, essentially what is a wormhole. Um, so this is the secret of non-commutativity as quantum biology. And it also explains the ecological crisis because by relying on the commutative symmetric mathematics, then the external measurements that we make for technology are then increasing the gravitational entropy on Earth. So as Roger Penrose points out, the entropy of matter is the opposite of the entropy of gravity. And so when we try to decrease the entropy of matter through technology, we're actually increasing the entropy of gravity. And this, this comes directly from, New, from Newton, Newton relying on music theory. So the Architas, Architas was a military engineer. And so essentially the, um, he defined music based on the tension, the tension of the, uh, the tension of the string. So the string is the, the matter that then when you square the weight, then it doubles the frequency by increasing the tension in the string. And actually I had this discussion with a um, music researcher who got a PhD and he asked me to submit an article to his journal, or it's it's a journal that he was published in, but he reviews on the journal, and I didn't I didn't fall through with it because it's like a one of those kind of like um, it's considered to be a predatory journal, you know. If he's asking me, like he says that, what I, his since I understood his analysis of the problem of defining the Pythagorean um, principle based on the tension of the string, that this is actually an error from Architas. And um, this fellow, he doesn't even get into Architas that I saw when I read his paper. Maybe his other papers do, but essentially he's talking about the physics principle and he's arguing that there's a and there's an intrinsic uh, tension that goes against the external tension. And so this is another way of stating that the in Louis de Broglie, there's two different times. You have an internal time and an external time. So the internal time is, again, what you know these different names for time is. It's fundamental time, primitive time primordial time, and now you have internal time. That's what Louis de Broglie called it. And so in meditation, this is, this is not a metaphor. It's literally the internal time that you experience when you close your eyes. And, you, and as Vandana Shiva stated, she, she did her PhD in quantum non-locality. Um, and so she emphasizes that growth comes from within. The quantum biology is based on you have to have growth from within, not as an external measurement. So that's the secret of um, yoga and meditation, but it's also the secret of ecology. It's the secret of life on earth at, from negative entropy is it has to be from within. So that's pretty much the secret of um, 
non-commutativity and Basil, Basil J. Hiley, he told me that um, he hasn't studied gravitational entropy. You know, that's not been his focus. So he can't really comment on it. But Roger Penrose has pointed out that the, you know, the, this, this explains the global warming crisis. And he just said it in passing, you know, as if, like, he, he, I don't think, I don't think he thinks that humans will fix global warming. But he's focused on the universe and what it means, you know, the whole, the whole thing. <laughs> So he's kind of, he's doing his own thing. And the other thing is, it's like, well, I mean, everybody passes on and they, and you can, you can watch uh, near death experiences and study people's experiences that they report. And that's very much the same as deep meditation where you, you're each of us as a ghost inside of us and the ghost leaves our body. And all of a sudden we realize we're not in our body anymore and we start and we realize also that all of our perceptions are inherently non-local so our sense of smell is non-local our vision is non-local um everything we is a holographic reality that can be the more you meditate the more you can experience this and so this is what people report when they have their your death experiences, but also as people, as people naturally age, then they start to realize that, hey, you know, they're going to have to encounter the truth of reality um, and then realize that inside, being inside their body, being on the planet in Earth is just like a temporary experience and that there's this there's this deeper level of reality of the universe as a whole, and um, and so that's what I think Roger Penrose. I mean, he's he's um, ninety one now, and so he's you know he he gets like when he was interviewed by Lawrence Krauss. Lawrence Krauss didn't didn't discuss um, non commutativity at all. He didn't discuss the palatial twister model of Penrose and he ignored it. And it's like, well, he claimed he understood Penrose, but if you're, if he ignored all of Penrose's recent uh, talks on YouTube about the precognition and um, the palatial twister model relies on non-commutativity. And, and so Penrose is arguing that our, that, at a certain level of reality, like when we're really in the zone as like a well-trained body mind harmonization, you know, whether as an athlete or a musician, then we actually literally are relying on precog precognition or er in meditation. And then um, as uh, Stuart Hamroff says, you know, like if you take a psychedelic or something that'll have the same kind of a effect. And so that's, this is why you can't, you can't reproduce it with the external technology because it's also the secret of being alive because it's eternally like it's what um, Yogananda called ever new, ever fresh. So you're, you know, you're, it's the secret of eternity as it's always changing and as Alain Kahn says, it's a, it's the an infinity of infinite degrees of freedom, that's e an eternal rolling motion, that's unescapable, and so this is the secret of um, primitive time, and it's why it's it's also spooky at a, action at a distance that disproved Einstein and it disproves the linear um, causality that relativity. Uh, relies on and so as as successful as relativity is it's also directly connected to the abrupt global warming crisis and the ecological crisis that's um, leading to biological annihilation of life on earth and so this is the the Faustian bargain that was created when we created modern western science 
for, you know, relying on external measurements and technology and all the fun, the fun so-called efficiency that everybody, you know, likes from using um, energy, the petrochemical energy that originates from the secret power of the sun, the negative the negative entropy, dark energy, the gravitational potential that originates from this non-locality um, that our, our ancients knew about. The ancients called it the, you know, why the sun is female or the, the um, darkness behind the sun or why the sun is cold. You know, these kind of um, secret, uh, the cosmic mother of the sun and so anyway, it non-commutativity, it explains the spiritual paranormal. It also explains why we cannot, why we have this existential ecological crisis and it can't be solved by standard Western science based on external measurements, um, which is a hard thing for people to accept, but this is what we've come to. And so we, the mathematics of standard science, the commutative geometry ever since Plato is actually a type of addiction because we're addicted to our left brain um, and right hand technology, the dominance of the left brain with the linear sense of time as efficiency. And then the, directly tied to right-hand technology as external measurements and applied technology and engineering. So this is the inherent um, limitation that then speeds up time and destroys space as ecology on Earth. It's, this is what I call the um, strong misanthropic principle because what's considered to be the constants of the universe as we study the accelerating expansion of the universe is directly tied to the destruction of life on earth as biological annihilation. And that phrase is directly from Google scholar. It's the conservation biologists are using that phrase biological annihilation. And that the, the force of humans on earth is more powerful than any geological um, era. The, the power of geology as time is superseded by humans, uh, the technology of humans creating biological annihilation. And so this is what non commutativity explains. And it's also why um, another reason why the standard science doesn't want to deal with non commutativity. And so I discovered um, even, you know, even quantum physicists, they'll, they, even if they are into David Bohm or the, the de Broglie Bohm model, that doesn't mean that they will study non-commutativity. And so there's not the non-commutativity. It's like this secret layer to um, physics and you know, I discovered it through my study of music, my training in music, and then that led me into meditation. And then that led me into a study of, of physics and science in a hard, so-called hard science. And I didn't, I didn't plan on studying hard science. I, I, I tested in the 98th 98th percentile in biology in for the ACT out of high school and I took biology in high school and I I was more you know I was always outside fishing or canoeing on the lake that I lived across from or just hanging out in the woods in the tree with the trees and getting poison ivy and <laughs> not I'm not like some outdoors survivalist i'm just a i just like i like the beauty of nature that's what i really like i like the 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 like i like the natural sounds the beauty of it the 
clean air, the, you know, the, the, um, like when we, when I lived in Alaska, we drank the water right out of the land from the, from the local bog. We didn't, we didn't filter it or anything. So that's very rare. Apparently you can't really do that anymore. But I did that when I was 19 years old for four months. And so anyway, um, so that's, that's just, that was the, my latest moderation of my debate between um, David Chester and Professor Jean Brimon about um, non, well, see, I, I'm, I'm coming from non commutativity and neither of them are, because even though Jean Brimon studies um, De Bruyne, the De Bruyne Bohm model in terms of non locality, he says that he do, he does not think that Alain Kahn understands quantum physics properly, even though um, he says that Alain Kahn is a genius, you know, on it in his own terms. But um, the you know quantum physics they rely on experiments, and so then. Um, this is why Bell's inequality was so crucial because it was actually a series of experiments and it disproved Einstein even. And, but, you know, Basil J. Hiley, he did work with David Bohm and he, he does emphasize non-commutativity and he says it's not just mathematics, but it's actually physics. And so he, he is doing this weak measurement experiment with uh, Robert Flack with the argon to test non-commutativity. And I, and I corresponded with Robert Flack. He confirmed to me, you know, they're back at it. Um, but they were shut down due to the pandemic. And so, um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mean to get, get involved in this physics, you know, cause I don't, I mean, <laughs> most people would think I'm not qualified, but I just study the concepts. I don't do calculations because as um, Roger Penrose points out, you know, consciousness is not a calculation. And I think what happens is people get, they learn, they do the calculations with the mathematical formulas and then they get this left brain attachment or addiction even to the their specific mathematical perspective and without, so they're, they're not, they get trapped into that, the, con, the conceptual realm of those, of those mathematics. And even non-commutativity, you know, it's just mathematics, but it does connect to this actual deeper level of uh, quantum biology. And, um, Basil J. Hiley, he says this explicitly, and he writes about quantum biology. And he said he didn't have time to get into the, the details of, on quantum biology. But that's something I have. I have spent the time to get into that, both through using my own body and brain as an experiment and also um, studying the science of the quantum biology. And that's what my research has been about. I've posted the my training manual that goes into it and um and so that's all i have to say i've talked for an hour and i just want to thank the various physicists for corresponding with me and dealing with my um lack of knowledge on the topics and i'll just leave it at that <laughs>